If you run just like that and do nothing else, no workouts, you're gonna have an improvement in performance. And the way that most runners screw it up is number one, they never train really fast. They run easy and then kind of moderate, but they never train the fast twitch fibers. Don't do that. And the second way that a lot of runners and athletes screw this up is that when they do workouts, they run in the yellow zone. Don't do that, avoid it like the plague. Remember that elite athletes do the polar opposite. Today, we are gonna be talking about intensity training zones. Should you be going hard? Should you be going easy? Should you be going somewhere in between? And then how often do you wanna up the intensity and go hard? I'm gonna share with you the training of three of the best distance runners who have ever lived. The top secret uh, training that I have delivered to me personally from one of them. Let's jump into it. What I want you to do is look at the training zones. We've got green, yellow, red. So this is the way that most runners train and that curve that you see is the distribution of training that's done in each of the zones. This is how athletes in other sports train as well, but cyclists, runners, swimmers, triathletes train predominantly like this. Now, I'm telling you how most people train, not how elites train. What does this say? It's never truly hard, it's never all out, it's never really ball busting, and it's never truly easy, or what I sometimes call stupid slow jog. It's kind of like this yellow in between. And maybe that's you as well, because it's very easy to get lulled into this. If we run slower, it doesn't feel like we're working out all that much, but we're not fully rested and ready to really hammer it. And so we just get stuck here. Let's look at what elite athletes do. They do the exact opposite. Look at that, the curve is literally opposite. Instead of an arc, it's a U. It's not even a symmetric U, it's skewed so that most of the training is done in the green. Now, about 80%, you've heard this principle before in probably many areas. It's the 80-20 principle, the Pareto principle. In short, 80% of the running that elite runners do is in the green zone and 20% is not in the red zone. 20% is in the red and the yellow combined with most of that being in the red with almost nothing in the yellow. Now, when we put them side by side, you can really see that there's a stark difference going on here because if we look over on the left here, the way that they train doesn't leave much room for things like very hard intervals or tempo runs that are very fast but not quite as long, like 20 minute really hard tempo runs. And it doesn't leave a lot of room for high mileage because by necessity, if you're gonna run very high mileage for yourself, then most of it has to be done easy, most of it has to be done slow to avoid things like injury, redundant impact forces, and burnout, metabolic burnout, nervous system burnout, all kinds of these things. If you really wanna maximize your mileage, most of it has to be done by definition, easy, and you can't do that. So what this says is that elite runners have the potential to have much higher mileage and also much higher quantity of hard work on top of that mileage. Even as, even as a percentage, even though the percentage of hard running may be lower, it's a percentage of a much bigger number. And so the objective amount is much higher. And this is what leads to high performance. So let's look at a couple of runners from history and look at how they trained. So let's take a look at one of the greatest of all time, Emil Zatopek. There's this great book and this outlines his entire life really and all of his accomplishments. But what is really insane is it outlines his training. We get to see an in-depth look at how this guy trained. Now, some things that he did that were really kind of odd to most runners is that he did a lot of intervals, but his intervals were not full sprints. They were just pretty hard. They were faster than, he was a 5K and 10K runner predominantly and his intervals were run at faster than 5K pace. And for an Olympian, that's pretty darn quick. So we're gonna put that in the red, and he would do something upwards of, check this out, okay? 100, 400 meter runs in a given session. And he would do this day after day after day after day after day after day after day. I think his mileage was something like, here we go. I opened right to that page, look at that. 175 miles per week to up to 240 miles per week. So here's an example of uh, Zatopex training, ready? I'm gonna read this to you off page 210 here. Monday, 70 400s. Tuesday, 40 400s. Wednesday, 40 400s. Thursday, 80 400s. It goes on and on and on and on. Okay, this is quite a lot. Quite a lot of mileage, right? 
And he, he did this because he did short intervals. He never did mile intervals. He never did tempo runs. He did these intervals that were really fast, relatively short. For a guy like him, they were just over a minute long. And then he took a recovery that wasn't terribly long. And then bam, into it again, bam, into it again. Now he was only able to get to this place from decades of foundational building, but leading into his competition, he would then pile on all those red and yellow zones. And so when we see that graph that I showed you just a minute ago, it's not that elite runners train like that every week. It's that over the course of a training cycle, that's going to be how their running is quantified. So Zadapek would would get a lot of green running and some red running. And then at the end, he would do a heck of a lot of red running, beef that up with some of that yellow running in there. Okay, this is how Zadapek would train. Now I'm gonna share with you at the end of our presentation here today, I'm gonna share with you a little bit more about that specific way of training. Let's look at Eliud Kipchoge. Now Kipchoge is the world record holder in the marathon. He broke two hours in a controlled environment. Hard to not say that he's the greatest marathoner of all time, one of the greatest runners of all time. Now. When we take a look at his training, seven weeks leading up to his world record in Berlin, and you can see him down here. That was him setting a world record, 201, baby. We know what his training looked like seven weeks prior to it. We also know what his training looked like before he broke two hours, and it looked similar to this. What did he do? Well, 80% of his running was done very easy. And so this is measured in kilometers total that he did in the seven weeks leading up uh, to his world record. You can see how most of it is easy, and then everything else combined is still less. All other paces, all marathon pace runs, all tempo runs, all intervals, all hard long runs, all sprints, all fartlek runs, all of it, it's less. And look at the the red, which is going to be, you know, track interval, fartlek. And for him, uh, tempo run is pretty darn fast. He can actually run it. His threshold pace is actually pretty darn close to his VO2 max. And so that actually is a hard run for him. It's a very small percentage. So we talked about Zatopek, Kipchoge, and Bob Schul. Bob, you can find this book. You can write to him uh, in the long run. He details his training. The only American to ever win the 5,000 meters at the Olympics. This is how he, he trained as well. I actually have his training manual here. He sent it to me. I keep it in plastic so I could take it to the track with me and use it and it doesn't get messed up. But he did the same thing with these short intervals. Okay, short intervals. Let's give you an example. He would run doubles often on Sunday in the morning. He'd do a warm up and then 10 100 meters and then 14 150 meters. Then eight, the 800 meter recovery jog and then six by 200, a little bit faster, maybe about 5K pace. Then 10 300 meter runs at about his 10K pace and then 10 100 meters easy. So over the day, I mean, we could add that up. He's, he's accumulating a ton of work at 5K, 10K pace, which is pretty fast. It's a lot, but he does short intervals. And by doing that, he can repeat this. Because he did, let's see, he did that on Sunday. On Monday, same thing. 10 by 100, 20 by 100, 10 by 150, 10 by 100. That was in the morning. Monday PM, same thing again. And that's just Monday. Tuesday, he did a double. Wednesday, he did a double again. He just did this twice a day, every day. And that's how he got flipping fast. And he was able to win at Tokyo in the 60s. All right, how do you execute on this? How do you how do you know what length of intervals to run? This is partly art, partly science. Here's some of the science of it. I want you to look on the left column and look at the yellow and the red. So these are different work to rest ratios. Okay, so in the yellow, you see a 30 second on, a 30 second off. Below that, you see 60 second on, 60 second off. Two minute on, two minute off, three minute on, three minute off. We're creating equal work to rest ratios. So if you did an hour of any of these, you'd have the same amount. You'd have 30 minutes of hard running, 30 minutes of recovering, no matter which one of these you chose. But now let's look at the differences between the short interval and the long interval. So let's look at oxygen uptake. Now we move over to the right. Let's look at the yellow. And what we can see is as the interval length increases the oxygen uptake, and this is measured in the liters per minute. You see that it goes up from 30 seconds to 60 to two minutes to, to three minutes. It goes up. Okay. How about pulmonary ventilation? Same thing. It goes up. How about heart rate? It goes up from 150 to 167, 178, 188, which is very high. And blood lactate goes up significantly as well. So as the duration of an interval extends, all of these metrics become more overtaxed, more worked. Now, is that what you want in some of your training towards the end when you're getting ready to peak? Yes, this is what you want, but this is not sustainable. 
it's not sustainable to go out every day. So remember, Bekele was doing 30 100 meter strides. That's almost two miles worth of four minute mile pace running. Now, if he if he did that even in three minute intervals, he's running 1200 meters at a time at four minute mile pace. Now, if he did that three times in a row, he'd get the same amount of mileage, but it would be really taxing emotionally, <laughs> cardiovascularly, psychologically. It'd be too hard. And so the actual workload is going to either have to be less or it's going to have to be slower. And so the beauty of short intervals, 100 meters, 50 meters, up to 400 meters and not over. None of these guys did over 400 and they're very fast. So for someone like you or I, we're looking at 200 or 300 meters kind of at the upper limit and then recovering and doing them again and again and again and again and again. This is the magic of, you've probably heard before, the term strides. Strides are just this. It's doing a fast run for a very short period of time and doing it again and again and again and trying to rack up as much of this as you can over a week, not in a single session, getting miles and miles and miles and miles and miles of fast running under your belt per week without ever really maxing out your metabolic systems, your ventilatory system, without flooding your body with lactate. You get the muscles really strong. You get the nervous system and the neuromuscular coordination really dialed in. And then what you've done right there is create such a base of fitness that you can go stack on these giant kind of like orange and some yellow, which would be kind of like marathon pace runs. You can stack some of those on and have huge workouts later on in your training because you have, you've done so much easy running and you have the aerobic system and you have the soft tissue integrity, uh, like the strength of your plantar fascia and your tendons and your muscles and your bones. And you also have the speed. So you, you, you have the speed development from all of these strides and short intervals. And then what you can do is you can string them together and make giant workouts later on. And what I want you to do is do most of your training in the green, 80% at least. And if you're in base training, go ahead and do even more even more than 80%, almost all. And then I want you to do some, sprinkle in some training in the red. And that's it. If you run just like that and do nothing else, no workouts, you're gonna have an improvement in performance. And the beauty is that this is what I call base training. This is a sustainable improvement of performance that you can, you can live in and you can do month after month, season after season, and then you're building such a foundation that you can slowly increase your mileage. You can accumulate more speed work and get stronger, but your injury risk is always very low because you're running mostly easy and only some fast, but you're never really maxing out the internal system. So you can do this, you can do this all day, every week, every month. You could train like this year round and you're gonna get pretty darn fit. And then when you wanna race, well, we work backwards from there and that's where we we then want to put in your support phase of training and your specific phase of training. And we want to make that finite. That's a maximum of about 12 weeks if you want to peak your performance. But you can get better and better and better and better and better and better slowly over time just with this kind of training. And the way that most runners screw it up is number one, they never train really fast. They run easy and then kind of moderate, but they never train the fast twitch fibers. Don't do that. And the second way that a lot of runners and athletes screw this up is that they do when they do workouts, they run in the yellow zone. Don't do that. Avoid it like the plague. Remember that elite athletes do the polar opposite. They train almost nothing in the yellow, everything in the green, and some, boom, in the red. So let's take a lesson from them. That's all I have for you guys here. I hope you enjoyed this training. Take care. Bye-bye.